This morning, I want to open our Bibles up to Exodus chapter 20. We'll look at verse 8 through 11. This week, we are on the fourth commandment. We'll be on this for a few weeks, this week and next week. And today, I kind of want to um, give you half of why Sabbath is important for our life. Maybe give us seven reasons for Sabbath. And then next week, I want to give you seven, re- seven things that kill our Sabbath that we should be mindful of. Um, and so we'll just kind of begin here in Exodus 20, verse 8 says this, Remember the Sabbath day. The fact that he commands us to remember the Sabbath day means that there will be many opportunities for us to not consider the Sabbath. Many of us will get busy doing what we do and we'll forget the Sabbath. To keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It needs to be set apart. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your sons or your daughters, your male servant, your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Now, I kind of think this is a way for him to talk to you about the difference between your work and God's work. How much he can accomplish in very little amount of time. And how much of the time we go to work for the Lord and we don't accomplish near as much. How many of you ever feel like you just don't have enough hours in the week to get everything done that you need to get done? Oh, me too. Me too. But God kind of got on to me for that because right here in verse 11, he says, God created the whole heavens and the earth in six days. What's your problem? And so I answered it this way in my journal. My problem is that I'm in too much control of what I do in my week. And I'm not, God is not in control. Because if he were in control, I would have enough time in the week to accomplish everything that needed to be accomplished. The reason we're always behind and never truly catching up is because we are setting the course of our week. What should be done, what should not be done. And we're not allowing God to lead our work here on earth. That's important. And so we need to remember... Uh, our Sabbath, we need to keep it holy, and we need to remember that if we let God lead us in our week, He can do a bunch of stuff in six days. All right, so that's, that's kind of a good and encouraging. For six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the seas, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, just so you know, this is Also making reference to, in some sort, Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, where it said that God made the heavens and the earth and all the sea and everything that was in it. And just so you know, we haven't even discovered or been able to be at certain depths of the ocean. Um, There is just so much undiscovered, um, unknown, and God created all of those things. Now think about that. In six days, he made it all, and it's been thousands of years, and we haven't even explored all that he's made. That's pretty amazing. So when then Christians, and I'm going to hammer this down again. I know I've already said it. When Christians are living their weekly, daily lives, and they say they never have enough time to do all the things they need to do, I just know that they're not allowing God to do that work through them. Okay? And also, um, just so you know, um, here's something that we need to know. There's just some things you don't need to be doing. That, that seems right and good to you, but may not be God. All right? So I just think that's very important. One thing we have to understand, we live in a culture today where um, people are busy. Right? Um, and, and really, we can, we can have idols, twin idols, I like to call them, of work and comfort. 
depending on the person you are, you either can be, have a tendency to worship work, the idol of work, or worship comfort, the idol of comfort. The reality is some of us worship comfort. We try to work as little as possible. How many of you have some teenagers in your house? I'm sure they're hard workers. I'm sure they're always helpful. But sometimes you've got to remind them of their chores because they would, they would rather play than work, right? Um, we try to work as little as possible. We're trying to be as unproductive as possible. Sometimes i got skill in that department, right? I, I just I got some mad skill when it comes to doing nothing. I can do nothing, in my, be in my nothing box, doing nothing, thinking about nothing, doing nothing. Some of us are working too much, though, and resting too little. And it keeps us from getting away from the twin idols of work or comfort. Some of you are killing yourself for your job and not doing enough work that God has actually worshipped. And sometimes this really is where people fail. Which are you? You don't have to say it out loud, but which are you? Do you work too much or do you work too little? Both are a problem when we're talking about the Sabbath day because it said that God worked for six days. So there was need for rest. Some of you have made a lifetime occupation out of rest. Okay, the Sabbath day, <laughs> right? The Sabbath day is not there for you to be in an eternal state of rest, right? So we're working, okay, the work's a part of it. Works part of it. Now, I just want to say this. This is important because we have some probably Old Testament, what you would consider scholars in here, and maybe New Testament scholars. Both are valuable. Um, when we look at Genesis 2, God, God works for six days and he rests on the seventh day. In the New Testament, what happens is Jesus goes and he does his work here on earth. He comes to earth, he does his work, and it says that he's hung on a cross. And he resurrects, he resurrects when? On the, the first day of the week, which is Sunday. This is, why New, this is why the New Testament church has its Sabbath on Sunday. Because we find our rest, it says in the Bible, in Christ Jesus. So if some of you are wondering why uh, we, don't, we don't worship on the seventh day, which is Saturday. Um, it's because we now enter into the rest of Jesus' completed work. Which is on the first day, right? When he resurrected. This is very important. So that's why the church here in America particularly, we're worshiping on Sunday. Now, so now the way we look at it is instead of working six days and then entering into our rest, we are starting with rest and working from rest. But there still is work. Okay, this is important. It's just the position. So this is why it actually talks about first fruits. We talks about going and worshiping in the temple. Let this worship be your first fruits. First day of the week, we celebrate the finished work of Jesus. And out of that, of remembering that, we then work the other six days. But work happens. Okay. What, what kind of work? What kind of work, you ask? I'm glad you asked. It says that we who were created in Christ Jesus, that means saved. We were created in Christ Jesus. We have his Holy Spirit. We are empowered. And we were created in Christ Jesus for good works from the first day of rest. It's important. You can do works in the flesh, or you can do works empowered by the leading of the Spirit. Let me tell you how you can know real quick. There's just one way. If you don't have enough time in your week to do everything that you have scheduled to do, it might be that you're working from your flesh and not trusting in the leading of the Spirit. We should never be at the end of our week and say, I never have enough time to do that because the Bible actually says you have enough time in your week to accomplish, in your day, to accomplish everything that God designed and purposed for you to accomplish. Some of us need to look at our list of stuff we're doing and we need to understand that some of those things, if we don't get it done every week, we have put in place of God. We've made that stuff more of a priority than God. Okay, <clears throat> so there's that we got to be careful that we're not so busy with stuff that we can't rest. We can't kick off our week with rest. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to say some stuff that may be offensive. <clears throat> All right, it's kind of my thing, right? So, um, 
most of people, what I would consider an older generation, I, I, I think I'm getting closer and closer to the older generation, like I'm on the, the brink of flipping over, like I'm almost a freshman, freshman, a freshman, fresh blood in the older generation. Like I don't know where it is. Is it 45? Is it because I'm 42? And like I'm getting close to being older. I can no longer say I'm younger. How do you know, Sean? Because I got ear, hair growing out of my actual lobe. Like, like my body's given up. It's like all the, all the pores that are holding back hair from all the... I'm, now hair's growing in all the wrong places because even my pores have given up, right? And it's just, it's, just, it's just crazy. I'm getting older. But the older generation, one thing I know, notice about them is that if you're doing... This is, of course, generic. It's all-encompassing. It's a, it's a real broad statement. And I don't think this necessarily applies to everyone. But generationally, older people don't have a problem historically working. The older generation historically tend to worship work, which is not good either. The younger generation tend to worship play. Some of you say, well, that's an overgeneralization. Yes, yes it is. An incredibly accurate one, in my opinion. But both are problematic. Okay, okay, worshiping work, that's idol worship. Okay? There are people in here today, I, I know I've been guilty, right? I, li- listen, mini- mini- <laughs> you got to learn, not just in ministry, but in life, how to say no to stuff. The reality is, if we could actually see, let me just say this, if we could actually see what some of our behaviors are actually saying, and what some of our behaviors are us actually doing, we would be mortified. The reality is, if I were to say a word picture like this, there are some parents in here today that are sacrificing their children and their marriage on the altar of their job or their work. You Think of the imagery of that. That would be horrifying. We would never, ever... Can imagine ourselves having this altar of work and sacrificing and killing our children and marriage on it, but we do it all the time here in America. We, we will sacrifice our children, we will sacrifice our marriage, and we will do it because we value work more than them. And God is challenging us on this. At the same time, there's a lot of people who are sitting on their do-nothing stool doing nothing, because they just don't want to do nothing. And God says it's different than that. You, you, can't, you can also worship just be playing all the time. Uh, that's why they make cracks right now. Nah, I'm going to move on. I'm not going to do that. that. That's why they make cracks right now. Of you know, um, And this isn't all young people. But you have, you have older generation who worked and sacrificed their family on work. And you have the younger generation, so the older generation, you looking at the younger generation going, all you guys do is sit around and play video games. Right? Both, it's funny that you cast judgment on your children who you sacrificed on the altar of your job, and now you want an opinion. You want to give an opinion about their life. You didn't get invested in their life because you were too busy working. Right? Isn't that interesting? And so we have each generation looking at it. And you know why? You know why they value play over work? Because they saw that you love work more than them. And they're not going to be you. And so what they've done is they swung to the other side. This generation has swung to the other side. I was talking to uh, my son. I was talking to a couple of his friends. I was, I've been asking questions. I've been asking questions of, you know, what, is, what do you consider a good work ethic? He said, you show up on time. You go to your job. And then I asked him some questions like this. <clears throat> because, see, we value, uh, we say a good work ethic is come early, stay late. They'll say this, come on time, leave on time. That's still a good work ethic. And what they're saying is, we saw you sacrifice your family to be early and to stay late. But we can do our job and still work and have balance because we value our family and we want to play a little too. They learned how to have the feelings, this new generation, they learned how to view work by the way you haven't done it right. I'm guilty, you're guilty, both are problematic, right? 
Both are problematic. Now it goes, Genesis 2, 2 says this. He goes back to creation and looks at what God modeled for us. He says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, listen, and made it holy. Now, notice what God celebrated on the seventh day. He celebrated His work. Here's what's problematic about our Sabbath day. We want to celebrate our work. But that's not what it's about. Our Sabbath is celebrating still God's work and Jesus' work. So if you take the Sabbath and, you, and you're, 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 you're looking back to all that you've accomplished, right? that's why it's the first day of the week, right? because we're celebrating what Jesus accomplished, not what you accomplished by the end of the week. This is very important. You can take the Sabbath day and not keep it holy when you make it about your work and not His. That's very important. So the attitude of the heart and the way we think is important. So then this question arises. And unless I'm, I, I just feel like it's important because these questions are there. And you know we have Seventh-day Adventists. They worship on Saturday. We, we, we talked about a little bit of New Testament. So is it which is the right day? Is Saturday or Sunday the Sabbath? Which one is it? Genesis 2.2. 2. I'm going to read it again. God said, worked six days, and on the seventh day he rested. What day was the seventh day? Saturday was the seventh day. It says in Exodus, work six days, rest on the seventh day. What day is the seventh day? Saturday. But in Revelation, John says this. He calls this Sabbath day the Lord's day. So it's the day for the Lord Jesus Christ, right? The early church started meeting, when we look in Acts, not on Saturday, but started meeting on Sunday. Acts 27 gives us one occasion. It says this, on the first day of the week, which is what? Sunday. In the Jewish calendar, that's Sunday. When we, when we were gathered together, it says... So it talks about the church getting together, worshiping, and celebrating Jesus on Sunday. All right? This is what we remember when we gather on Sunday. So I don't want to get any more into that. I agree with that. There's a lot of conversation around this. That's not where I'm going. I just wanted to go ahead and let you know where the evangelical church stands in regards to this and the reason why, generally. Okay. So the second question is this. Is the Sabbath binding on Christians then? Okay, here's the debate. So there are ten commandments. Nine of them are mentioned expressly and specifically, and they are commanded for us to follow in the New Testament. Nine of them. Yet there are ten. Actually, there are 613, but we're only talking about ten right now. Okay? But nine of these ten are actually spoken of and then con- re- repeatedly commanded for us to follow in the New Testament even. The, the one omission is the fourth commandment, which is what I'm talking about now, to keep the Sabbath day. That was not commanded in the New Testament. It's the Sabbath. So is it still binding for Christians today to worship on or to have and keep the Sabbath? That's the question that people are asking. It is, and I want to say this, it is not binding on us as it was those who lived in the Old Testament. Just hang on, though. Just hang on. I'm going somewhere with this. We, we got, we got, you got to know this. Here's how Romans 14, 5 through 6 says it. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. In other words, here's what he's saying. Saturday, if you want to do it that day, that's fine. Sunday, if you want to do it that day, that's fine. But do it unto the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Now this leads to the bigger issue, and that's, is this, how should we as Christians deal with the Old Testament law then, Sean? 
How should we deal with that? And the Ten Commandments are in the middle of the first five books of the Old Testament. Jesus calls them the law because there are 613 laws contained therein. How many of you think that the Old Testament laws are no longer binding on us? We don't have to, we don't have to pay attention to them. How many of you feel like that, right? That's not a trick question. Okay, good. Okay. But then there are people that I have talked to that say, Ten Commandments, that's no longer binding on us. We shouldn't even talk about them. We shouldn't even talk about them because God fulfilled all the law, and now we're in Him, so we don't have to do any of the Ten Commandments. They'll actually say that. I have people that say that. But then, if I tell you, what about murdering and stealing and having adultery, making adultery, making adultery, having adultery, being adulterous, right? I do English good, okay? Um, What about killing and stealing and adultery? What about those? We're like, oh yeah, the the same people who say we shouldn't worry about the Ten Commandments, we're in Christ Jesus, say probably shouldn't be killing people either. Probably shouldn't be stealing. So you're like, okay, so let's get rid of the Old Testament law, but let's keep a few of them, right? Okay, so that's kind of what I talk to them about. And the reality is, here's the thing. There is, although we are not bound to this law of the Sabbath, there is wisdom in it for us to gain from it. Okay? It's wise to not be going off and killing people, and it's wise to rest. So although we're not bound by it, we should still do it. Okay? Okay. Jesus says it this way. Not to abolish the law and the prophets, but he came to fulfill them. All right? It's all, in other words, it's all applicable to us. But let me explain it to you this way. Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. He says this in Matthew 5, 17. So the whole law is fulfilled by Jesus. Something radical happens when the law, when it comes to Jesus. This is why Romans 10, 4 says that Christ is the end of the law. All right? So think of it this way. Paul uses an analogy in a letter to a group of people called the Galatians. Now, I love, if you ever want to do some light reading, pick up Galatians. It's not light reading, right? Just, that was a joke. Um, uh, but pick up Galatians. And he says that the Old Testament law in Galatians, Jesus says the Old Testament law is like a school teacher. I love that example. I love that. So I can get, I can get with that, Right? Any of you remember going to school? I know it's been so long ago, but just you remember going to school, right? Oh, three. That's great. Um, um, do you remember going to school, right? Okay, good. The whole point of going to school is to teach you certain things so that you can graduate from it and not go to it no more. All right? I, I got an amen on that one. Like, I, I don't blame you. Like, I, it, it, is, it is rough. Right? Like the reality is we're not always waking up at 7 in the morning and going to school, being to school by 8, and then checking out by 3, and we're bringing our books with us, and we have our locker. That, like eventually we learn enough that we graduate, and we take what we learn, and we apply it to our life. But the reality is it's like the Ten Commandments is like a school teacher, that we learn something from them, and it becomes applicable to our life. So school's very good. School is very important, but school is not forever. That's important. Think of it this way. To use Paul's analogy of education, I graduated from high school. I know it, it seems shocking to some, but it's a fact. And when I went to high school, we had, let's just use biblical language, we had laws. We had to show up at a certain time. You had to be there so many days. You had to sit so many hours in class. You had to not, you had to raise your hand if you wanted to go to the bathroom. You had to get the hall pass, which then, quite honestly, you just get a key. You used to just get a key. Now you get a key with like a surfboard attached to it, right? Like, what are they doing with the keys? You, you, had, to, you had to get a certain grade point average. You, you couldn't, you know, smoke indoors. You couldn't kill anybody in the hallways. Fights were not thought highly of. You couldn't steal anything. You couldn't park in a teacher's parking spot because you get a closer spot. I know... From fact on that, I, I've done that. Not, not good. There's all these rules. Once you graduate from high school, though, some of the rules are still binding on you. Some of the rules you should still do. 
Some of them you don't have to do at all. Are you with me today? So when we evaluate the 613 laws, or let's just say for the sake of brevity here, the 10 laws, there are some things you should just still do. You're not in school anymore. We've graduated out of that. We're mature now. We know. We have learned. Like a school teacher, it has taught us stuff. Listen, and it's not that we are bound to. There are certain things we're still bound to, and there are certain things that's just good common sense. Don't be killing people. All right? You couldn't kill at school. You graduated from school. You still can't kill people now. All right? It's real simple. Like, like, and this is, this is about dumbed down theologically. I make this. Because there seems to be a lot of talk about, well, which laws can I, I, well, can I not eat shellfish now? And what do I, I mean, what do I, I mean, I, all of you, if we are bound by every law, every one of you are going to hell. Because every one of you are wearing clothing right now that has multiple fabrics in it. Cotton and polyester. You're going to burn in hell. I mean, that's just one law out of 613. Are you with me? So we're not bound by that. We're set free from that. And this is why on the Sabbath, at the beginning of our week, we celebrate that he fulfilled all that. So when we then, at the end days, when we come stand before God, we are not presenting our transcript and said, we did well. We got all straight A's. Give me my gold medallion so I can, I graduated with honors, right? Like, like it won't be because of what you did. You're not presenting your transcript. Here's what we do on the Sabbath. We, we remember that Jesus' transcript was given to us so that when we stand before him, God evaluates Jesus' transcript as yours. That's good. So, so we need to understand this. At the same time that we understand what we have through Jesus, that's what the Sabbath day is for. So if... If, is it bad to watch a football game on the Sabbath? No. But if all you care about on the Sabbath is how awesome Mahomes is, and you haven't remembered what Jesus did for you, that's a problem. Okay? That's a problem. And the reality is, God is telling us here to remember Jesus. You know why? Because we don't do it very often. To take a day, set it aside, and remember Jesus. Now, here's what I'm tired of today. Here's what I'm tired of today. All right? I'm going to pick on us a little bit. <clears throat> I'm tired of people saying that they cannot keep a day, let's say Sunday, what the evangelical church said, because they've got to work. You've made your work your God. And you chose to choose that over God. I don't care. If, like, if, if they're going to fire you because of your religious beliefs, get another job. It's that important because we make a choice with where we work, how we work, when we work. We choose either God or we choose our job. Okay. I'm not, I don't care about attendance here. We don't report it to anybody. I don't need you to be here to make me feel good. I'm trying to help us understand that every day we are, we are oftentimes making decisions that put God second and everything else we cherish ahead of him. He said it's important. Okay, let me, let me say this. Um, I'll just move on. So I want to give you this real quick. We're going to go down there real quick. I want to give you seven reasons why we Sabbath. And then next week I want to give you seven reasons that kill our Sabbath. So this is going to be more encouraging, if you will. Next week will be like, oh my gosh. Okay, anyway, but, so just soak in the gentleness of today, right? Number one, reasons why we Sabbath. One, to remember Jesus' work. Quite simply, we stop our work to remember Jesus' work. True or false? Christians believe that we're saved by works. True or false? Okay. Sometimes the preacher will get up and say this. You're saved by grace, not by works. Actually, no you're saved by Christ, not by grace. Okay, listen to me. You're like, that's semantics, Sean. Oh, is it? Because what it is, is grace is what comes because of Christ. It's what we, it's what we benefit from because of Christ. And, and the reality is, much of us, many of us are guilty of wanting what comes from Him and forsaking Him. So the Sabbath day is remembering Jesus Christ, 
not the grace that came from him. So when a pastor then gets up and says something like this, we're saved by grace and not by works. <laughs> no, you're saved by both because of Jesus Christ. Because the reality is the work that Jesus did made, a, he was, made him holy enough that when he died and resurrected from the grave, his work that was done perfectly and finished, in case you didn't know, that he went to heaven, he sat down, he put his feet up on his finished work, that work then becomes your work and it becomes the thing that makes you holy enough to get into heaven. Are you with me? So we are saved by grace. We are saved by Christ, Jesus Christ, from grace and from works. Okay, you with me? Okay, anyway, whatever. I, I just think we, we, we talk too much. We talk too much and we build foundations around what comes from God and we forsake Him in the process. And that's just as bad, okay? We got to be careful about that. All right. Not our work, but His work. Number two, we Sabbath to connect with Jesus and His people. This, it's like, how can you rest and deal with people? How do we do that? I'm glad you asked. Number two, we connect with Jesus and His people. The Sabbath forces us to spend time with the Lord and His people. And one of the things we remember on the Sabbath when we consider Jesus Christ is we remember that He loved people enough to die for them even when they were not worthy of such a display of love. For us to be in a place where we love God but we don't care so much for His people, we have not remembered Christ the way we should. Okay, can people be annoying? Absolutely. Guess what? If you're annoyed with somebody else, there's a good chance they could be annoyed with you. Right? You ain't all that. That's it. You just ain't all that. And I know, I know for me, like, because we, we live in a world where, like, everything, like, when we open the, when we worship, we're, we're thinking about us. When, when we open the Bible, we're going, how do I fit? What can I learn? It's about us. We've got to be careful about that, right? Because really the Bible is not about you. It's about him. So, so we, we live in a hyper-individualistic mindset because the reality is we will, we will bend our life and we will find ease and comfort at the risk of, of, of sacrificing what Jesus died for our time with community and people. Right? Jesus died for the church, right? And the Sabbath forces us to spend time with the Lord and His people. This is time for what we do on Sunday, Bible reading, prayer, silence and solitude. Uh, some go for a hike. That's my wife. She goes for the hike and she, God speaks to her and she, she sees God in nature like it says in the Bible. I, I just see... Poison ivy and bugs, and I sweat. It just doesn't do it for me, folks. I just, I, I, you know, it just doesn't do it for me. And I want you to know, my Sabbath is going to look different than her Sabbath. But what we can't do is we can't be so interested in pursuing how we rest that we forsake everyone in our rest. Okay, this is good. I'm trying. Jesus died for the church. That is not one person. It is for this. It's for community. So if you don't value community, I question whether you really love God. Because if you love God and you're in a relationship with Him, you will value what He values. All right. So God wants us to understand that. It's important. The Sabbath is to connect us with Jesus and His people. Sometimes we get so busy that we have time for things and not for people. Amen? We're so busy working on the house, the car, the job, that we forget people in the process. And we forget Jesus. Remember, Jesus died for people, not things. Some of you work harder for the things you have than the relationships you have. And God is trying to correct that. 
Our, our, our day today is so superficial and shallow. I mean, most of us, what we know about people is primarily what we read off their posts on the internet. And that's not really who somebody is or really how they're doing. Can I get an amen on that one? It takes the face-to-face time to really grow the relationship. And the Sabbath affords, enables, and enforces this in our lives. It's important. If Jesus can die for somebody, I can care about them enough to get to know them. The church matters. And the Sabbath reminds us not only of Jesus, but the people that he died for. Number three, Sabbath prepares us for eternal rest. I'm going to do this really quick. I don't want to stay here very long. I think it's important. But in Hebrews 4, 8 through 10, it says this. He likens heaven to an eternal Sabbath. It doesn't mean there won't be work, but the work won't be cursed, so it will be easier. Okay. Some of you think that when we go to heaven one day, and it's the last day, and we face the final judgment, we go, we're well done, good and faithful servant, you may enter in, that we're going to enter in, and wings are going to pop on our back, and a halo is going to be over our head, And I'm going to play a harp in the clouds and just float around in oblivion forever. Actually, no. The Bible actually says, and many commentators say, that heaven will be a mighty place of industry. Except for, we will see work in the light of God's holiness. Meaning, void of sin. So now, our work won't be be us doing it by the sweat of our brow or the blood of our hands. Um, There will be favor in our work. When we work, it will be easy. That's what heaven will be like. It's called the new heaven and the new earth. Guess who's going to be there? Some people working. But working without sin and the oppression of what that does in our ability to work things out. Number four, we obey the Sabbath, we keep the Sabbath to mirror the rhythm of God. Now, this is my favorite. All right? There's nothing more annoying than when you are trying to play in a band and... People are not playing in beat with the drummer because you have your own rhythm. I don't care if you're feeling it or not. There is a rhythm that we should be keeping. So, so okay, like, like, like for instance, when you see a conductor at a uh, symphony, is that right? Um, and a conductor, I, I think, is very important, always has his back to the audience because he doesn't care about you. He just cares about how they're playing in rhythm. Right, so the conductor keeps the rhythm. You, you, you. The the reason the conductor is there to make sure that you stay in rhythm. There is one person setting the rhythm. Let me tell you who's setting the rhythm for us as believers. God. He sets it all the way back to the beginning. So when we begin to talk about things like Sabbath or different things in the New Testament, one of the things we need to ask is, what? Where is this principle first mentioned in the Bible? Well, we can draw all this back, all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, where God then does work and then enters into his rest. So we see the rhythm. There is a rhythm here. There is six days of work and one day of rest. That's the rhythm that God sets for our life. We should set our life according to the rhythm that God set in a way that was first mentioned in the Bible. Good news. Jesus took naps. Good news. That's good news. Praise the Lord. I love myself some naps. I love it. Jesus did it, and we're supposed to remember Jesus. We're supposed to remember Jesus' naps, amen? I want a nap. I like, you probably shouldn't, you know, you, you, I, I like naps. You sometimes need to take a nap, people. I, I, I really think I'm going to labor this a little bit because I think this is important for our world. In a world where we're trying, constantly trying to We're constantly trying to live up to false images portrayed online. I guarantee you that most of the people you see that you admire out online, they're not actually doing all the things they say they're doing. So you're setting the course of your life based on an image that isn't even real. He said, base the rhythm of your life on me. God was as glorified. I took a nap yesterday. God was as glorified in my nap as he is in this sermon. You know what naps say? Let me say this. Naps say you're sovereign 
and you can do it all by yourself. And when you're unwilling to take a nap, what you're really saying is, I don't trust you, God, with all the stuff I got to do. Rest. Rest is a statement of trust in the sovereignty of God when you aren't on call. That's good. I, I like that. I, I wasn't even my notes, so I like that. All right. We live in a world in which a lot of people don't believe in the, Bi- the God of the Bible, but they still observe the seventh day of the week. Amen? Yeah. They, they don't believe in God, but they still obey this. Why? Because it works. Rest works. Recuperation works. There were actually two historical experiments, one in France, one in Russia, where with communistic atheist revolutions, they tried to do something other than a seven-day week because they didn't want any of their culture built on the instruction that came from the Bible. So they tried to change the seven-day week approach. Guess what happened? It failed. And they went back to a seven-day week. Why? Because what God has put together, let no man tear asunder. He's, He's developed a rhythm in life. That you should not change because if you change it, it doesn't work right. And stuff starts dying when you do not follow his rhythm. God is life. And if you move out from under God, things start dying. Number five, we obey the Sabbath to save others and ourself from ourself. That's good, man. I like that. Because I got problems. I mean, how many of you got some problems, right? I got problems. And sometimes I just got to save myself from myself. You know, you know the hardest critic in my life is? You want to know who it is? Me. Sometimes I just need a break from me. I just need a break from me. I'll be honest with you. The most destructive person in my life is me. I don't do what I'm supposed to do. I don't sow where I'm supposed to sow. I don't reap what I'm supposed to reap. I don't sleep when I'm supposed to sleep. The reality is the most dangerous and destructive person in my life is often me. I push myself in ways that I would never push anyone else. I push myself in ways that I would never push my children. I just... I push myself in ways that I would never push my wife. I would never do it. We got to be careful. We got to be careful. Stop being, I, I tend to be a little bit of a Pharaoh slave driver for my own life. How many of you are like that? You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you are like that? Just constantly just pushing yourself to the next level. Just pushing. Sometimes you need to, it's good you can do a lot, but sometimes you need to sit down and you need to mark things off your list so that you can keep your Sabbath. And make it holy unto the Lord. Number six. We keep the Sabbath. Two more points. Number six and number seven. To, to have fun. Oh, oh, oh. It's crazy. You can be a Christian and have fun. Amazing. To have fun and make memories. You know what my kids are going to remember? They're not going to remember that I bought them a, a computer when they were 10, 16, 12, whatever. They're not going to remember that I bought them a car. not going to remember that. You know what they're going to remember? Memories. They're going to remember the days we went to Florida and we had fun. Like, like that's what they're going to remember. And sometimes you don't even have to pay for it. You know, your kids can be excited just walking around in the woods. Some of you are like, you don't know my daughter. She will not be. There's other stuff. There's other stuff you can do. Have fun. Make memories. That's, that's important. You know why we make memories? Because even in the commandment to honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy, it says, remember Christ Jesus So in regards to our relationship, as we remember him, we create opportunities for our children to remember those encounters, right? Remember, have fun. In case you didn't know, Jesus was fun. Now I know every picture you see, except for the one where he's laughing, that he just seems like so downtrodden and so upset. You know know why the Pharisees hated Jesus? Because they got invited to parties, because Jesus got invited to parties and they didn't. It's true, it's in the Bible. They didn't invite the Pharisees. See, Jesus was fun. He wasn't a party killer. He got invited because he was fun. Guess who hung out with Jesus the most? Guess who loved hanging out with them? Kids. 
If you're not fun, kids ain't going to hang out with you. You, 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 know, you know how I know Jeff Compton's fun? Because kids like hanging out with them. Is Jeff Compton different? Yeah, but he's fun. <laughs> he's fun. He's fun for me. When I go over to the house, I have fun. Like, I have fun. It's not so just being all heady and just being all deepish and just being all contemplative. Like, I get to let my hair down <laughs> or off or off when I go to his house and have fun. We need to have fun, amen? Christians they should have fun. I, I'm sorry, I love that party part. They were mad at Jesus because he got invited to parties and they didn't. Anyway, um, anyway I love that. All right. Number seven, the final one. We keep the Sabbath to learn the difference between time and energy management. And there is a difference. This is probably the most important thing you'll hear today. I feel like for our culture, listen to me. We need to learn the difference between time management and energy management. Because there are some things that take a little bit of time, but a whole lot of energy. And there are some things that take very little energy, but a whole lot of time. Now, we live in a world where it's constantly just telling you, manage time, time management, manage your time, manage your time. Hmm? Uh, be careful because energy is involved in that. Now, for instance, I like to go hang out and party. It's shocking, right? But I am introverted. So parties burn more energy for me in a smaller amount of time. Okay? So the way that I manage a party is going to be very different than the way that, let's just say, J.R. and Brooke manages a party. Right? Because she can spend a whole lot of time and very little energy inside of a party. I can spend very little time and have ten times her energy expended with less time. So when we consider our life, we understand that we are, we are burdened with time. We are, we are captivated by time. We are also captivated by energy. So when we look at our Sabbath, we must be mindful of both. And we must evaluate how we enter into our rest based on both. For instance, if I were to spend a lot of time somewhere and little energy, it'd be sitting with a cup of coffee reading a book from front to back. I love that. Very little energy, whole lot of time. Now for Brooke, she could get and read a book and, and for the sake of, she loves reading, but she can spend very little time and spend way more energy. So when we look at our Sabbath and we evaluate how it enriches our life, we must not just look at the time we spend places, but we also must consider the energy that that time investment brings in those places. This is important. We keep the Sabbath to learn the difference between time and energy management. Okay. I want to say this and I'm going to close. If I were to tell you today, as an example, to you had your tennis shoes here, slip on your tennis shoes and go for a run. Some of you, before you got to the back door, would be... <laughs> Some of you could get to your house here in Pleasant Hill. Some of you could run 10 miles before you really burned out of energy. Right? So, so, so some of you spend way less time, but some of you could run a marathon and actually have more breath in your lungs than someone who ran from the front row to the back door. Very little time, same amount of energy. Here's the reality, though. Here's the reality I want you to understand. This is why Sabbath is important. Eventually, everyone who runs will run out of energy, regardless of the time and the distance. Everybody. Some may run further. If you set your life and your rest based on someone else's running, you will never do the Sabbath like you're supposed to. Oh, this is important. Because many times we, we, we come in contact with people and we set the course of our life and we experience and, and set our Sabbath based on someone else's running. But they don't run like you. They, they might run further than you. And you might live your whole life without ever getting to a place 
where you are able to be restored. At some point, everyone will run out of energy. You can only go for so long, and then you have to recover. What goes up must come down. Are you with me? That's what the Sabbath is for. Next week, I want to talk to you about the seven Sabbath killers. All right? They're good. They're good. They'll help us.